It's good to be with you. Welcome to Class Outside. Today, we are going to learn how this 3D portfolio is built. To run this yourself, you will need a few tools. You will need 3D modeling software like Blender, which is necessary to change and edit the 3D scene. This project's code can be downloaded from GitHub. A code editor like VS Code can be used to view and edit the project. To install the files this project depends on, we will need a package manager like Node Package Manager. Some of the resources can be found linked below in the video description. The first step is to determine what the 3D environment should look like. The Blender file for the scene I used is available with the project on GitHub. For this example, we have two curved halves of a circle, similar to the Dao or Yin Yang symbol. We also have a bridge that was provided by a user on Sketchfab, also linked below. And we have this big rectangle. The goal for this environment is to have two sand beaches in the ocean. The ocean is what the rectangular plane should represent. For this project, the camera moves around the scene as the mouse wheel scrolls. For this to occur, we need a camera and a track for it to follow. The track for this was created very similarly to the video scroll along a spline path in 3JS. This process involves creating a path, extending it to reflect the direction you want the camera to follow, closing the loop, converting it to a mesh, and exporting the curved mesh as a JSON using a Blender add-on. A video going further into this and the link to the Blender add-on should also be found in the description. We can actually test out the camera's track in Blender with just a couple extra steps. If we add a sphere and give that sphere a constraint to follow the path, we can animate the sphere to travel along the path. Then we can do the same thing for the camera, placing it slightly behind the sphere. If we add this track to constraint to the camera and target the sphere, both objects will animate across the path and the camera will turn appropriately, following the sphere slightly ahead. We can hide the sphere from view and remove it before we export the complete model if necessary. Now, we have our 3D space and a path to move through it. What about some things to interact with? This project supports these links that, when clicked, perform an animation and move the camera. There are three parts to this in Blender. There's the main button we see with the item of interest. There's the empty camera position object. This is the position the camera will move to off of the track when the button is pressed. And there's also the button link armature. This includes a visit here button and an animation to reveal it. We can circle back to this after we review the code and add a new button together. Before moving on, it's important to note that the format of these names is important. Later in 3JS, we will see how these names are used to determine certain actions. Once you're satisfied with the scene, make sure you have exported your curve as a JSON file, and you export the scene as a GLB file, including the camera. Since we will be using this model in 3JS, I also suggest checking what it will look like using the 3JS.org slash editor tool. This tool imports the GLB file similar to how our code will import it in 3JS. If we choose to inspect our scene here, Sometimes we'll catch errors and oddities sooner. If there is no light in the scene, I may add one temporarily just to check that all of the expected textures are here and appear correctly. Once it looks good, delete any temporary lights. Then export again from here as a GLTF. The file exported from here should match the one that we load into 3JS shortly. Next, let's prepare the JavaScript project. Download the code from GitHub and then extract the zip file and open it in the code editor. Now we need to open a terminal window and run npm install. This should download all of the libraries this project depends on, like 3JS. After the libraries are downloaded, we need to add a few files to the project. In the dist and src directory, we should see two folders, one named models, and one named textures. In the models folder, we will add the curve JSON file named curvepath.json and our GLTF file named scene.gltf. These names are important for the code to see. If there are existing files here, we can replace them with our updated files. Now we need a few more files that can be found linked below. These include the environment map, which goes in the models folder, and the pure sky file that goes in the textures folder, which are both found on polyhaven.com. The water normals file is found on the 3JS GitHub page. Now that we have the project set up, we can review the code to see how it works. In app.js, we can see that this project runs something called an express.js server to serve the index.html file in the dist folder on port 3000. The index.html file creates a canvas from main.js, which comes from the setup scene method in main view.js. 
This setup scene method strings all of the pieces of this website together. First, we have a few paths labeled up top. A tool used in this project called Webpack builds the JavaScript files here into the bundle.js file we see in the disk folder. This is why the paths are relative to the bundle.js file. In the setup scene file, we first see the initial values for the environment. This includes the scene itself, a variable to represent the mouse pointer, the renderer, which is configured with the setup renderer function to have similar settings to what's seen on the 3js.org slash editor page. We also set up a ray caster with a maximum distance. This is how we can tell what our mouse is pointing at. I have another video that goes further into this topic, also linked below. We set up some global variables without much information, like what will be the water object, a store for our GLTF, a mixer to work with our animations, a clock, an object to track what other objects are selected, and a custom button link address object. Based on the name within the collection representing the link, we will later determine which address to send the user to. After configuring the basics, we load the GLTF we exported earlier from 3js.org slash editor. In model helper, we see where it is loaded. After the load, we add the GLTF to the scene and add the animations within the GLTF to that GLTF store object we created earlier. Then we set the environment mapping. This goes through each mesh in the scene and updates the materials to include the environment map we downloaded earlier. This is one way to modify how light will affect the objects in the scene. We also set up an ambient light. This illuminates everything in the scene. Without it, we might not see anything but the void. The getWater method searches the scene for an object with the name water plane and performs some steps to replace the rectangle we saw in Blender with a new plane that appears like moving water. I left another resource down below that dives deeper into this topic. Next, we load the same curve path we set up earlier. The Blender spline to 3JS video provides more details on this. Essentially, it takes each vertex in the mesh and creates a 3JS object similar to the path or curve found in Blender. This object is called a Catmull ROM Curve 3 and adds this to the scene. Next, it's time to work with the camera. We set up a perspective camera, as well as a camera holder. The goal is for this camera to travel along a curve and rotate as the curve does, while also being able to tilt slightly, depending on where the mouse moves on the screen. The camera holder will move along the track with the camera following along inside it, and the camera itself can be tilted from within, as it inherits the parent camera holder's rotation. We place the camera holder on the curve, set a position on the curve that the holder should face, and we rotate the holder around. Depending on how the camera holder is rotated, along with some other values, might affect whether scrolling down or up on the mouse moves the camera, forward or backward. Two more values are set up to keep track of the camera holder's position along the curve and the orientation of the camera inside. I have a few videos linked below showcasing the process of moving an object along a path as well as having the camera follow the mouse. We add some event listeners as well. We listen for the wheel to scroll, and then call on mouse scroll when this is sensed. We listen for the mouse to move and call on mouse move when this is sensed. And last, we listen for the mouse to be clicked and call on mouse click when it is noticed. Set sky sphere JPEG creates a sphere around the scene and applies an image to it. Next, we set up the effect composer and render pass. These are available in 3JS and allow us to perform something called post processing, or in other words, update the frame displayed to the user after its first render. The composer composes or tracks the order of processes to generate the frame that's displayed. The render pass is the initial render, and afterwards, we see something called an outline pass being added. This process is, again, given more detail in another video. Essentially, after the first render, a new outline pass is performed on the visible scene. The outline settings define how it will appear, and the intersections object will determine what objects should be outlined. Currently, this only includes objects with the word button in their name. Let's skip ahead for a moment to the animate function. Even though our scene has animations, that is not exactly what is meant by animate here. Here, animate describes what needs to happen for every frame that the website displays. We start by running update animation, which takes our mixer, which does correspond with our scene's mesh animations. This takes a change in time and informs the mixer about it. The mixer updates any object animations to reflect that change in time. Update positions is then run. If we look at position, we see that how much time elapsed since the last scroll is checked, and we only proceed if it is shorter than the expected movement duration. If the time pass is longer than the expected movement duration, we should believe that the animation or movement of the camera is complete, and then do nothing. If the time were less than the movement duration, we, sh we would perform one of two interpolation methods. One is to determine how far to move over time along the path and the other describes the movement between two arbitrary positions, like when we move from the path to a viewing position set up at Blender. 
These perform math operations, each frame to determine what percentage between the two points the object should be. This intends to create a smooth animation, instead of immediately teleporting us places. Handle camera rotation follows a similar pattern. The camera rotates to follow the mouse, and is expected to lag behind just a little for a smoother animation. Again, this checks if the camera is expected to have already reached its expected rotation, and if not, some math is performed to determine how close it should be over the time that has passed. Next, we have a conditional that assists when the camera is moving back onto the track. When the camera is facing an object and the mouse is scrolled, it is expected to return to the track. If the camera's position is considered to be on the track, we check if the last mouse scroll was longer than the expected time to return to the track. If so, we set a value stating that the camera has returned to the track. Below, we see a formula to update the material for the water object. This continues over time and persists the moving water appearance. Next, we check whether the cursor should change based on the length of selectable objects. If the mouse is hovering over something it can click, it should change to a pointer. And last, we tell the composer to render the scene. This goes through each step we added, first rendering the basic scene, and then performing that outline pass to outline anything our mouse is currently hovering over. To see what the mouse is hovering over, we need to look at the event listeners we set above. What the mouse hovers over changes when the mouse moves, and also when the mouse is scrolled. Both of these methods call update selectable objects. Update selectable objects uses ray casting to shoot a ray out from the camera and through the mouse, and it sees if it connects with any objects within a certain distance. If it does, the list of intersecting objects is then supplied to the add outline based on intersections function. This tells the outline pass that when it is run, it should outline the first intersecting object that includes the name button. Some more things happen too when the mouse is moved. We get the mouse pointer value, an XY coordinate that describes where the mouse is on the screen. And we pass that to handle mouse movement. Handle mouse movement prepares some of the values to determine the starting orientation of the camera and the destination orientation as well. It then sets the last mouse movement time. Since the last mouse movement time was updated, the next frame within the animate function will begin interpolating the rotation of the camera to that new location. When the mouse is scrolled, what we do depends on the camera's state. If the camera is not on track, we call a function to prepare to exit the track. This sets the last scroll time, which triggers the camera to start moving to a new position along the track, based on how long the mouse has been scrolling. The mixer is also updated to perform a reverse animation. The camera gets off the track by clicking on a selectable object. When that is clicked, an animation starts to reveal the Visit Here button. We then scroll away from a link, and we want the Visit Here button to reverse its animation and hide back inside the selectable object. This is done by determining the animation's name based on the name of the selected object, and retrieving the animation from the GLTF store based on that name. Then, it gets the armature connected to that animation, and returns an animation mixer for the armature's animations, which are now scaled to be in reverse. If the mouse is on B-track during a scroll, handle scroll will be run. Just like handle mouse move, this sets the last scroll time to the current time, as well as the starting and target distance to scroll to. During each following animation, the camera holder's position will be updated based on how close to the destination it should be since the last time the mouse was scrolled. Last but not least, let's see what happens when the mouse is clicked. Nothing will happen unless the mouse is over an object considered selectable. If the mouse is pointing at something selectable, it updates the selected object's name to the name of the first object intersected by the raycast. If the selectable object includes the name of button and not the name link, the camera will be moved to the position facing the object. The position is again found based on the name of the object. The start and target positions for the camera holder to move between are also set. The mixer is set to reflect the link animation we saw earlier and reversed. This animation will reveal the button here, and the current selected objects list will be updated. If the selected object name includes both the words button and link, we can expect to be clicking on the visit here button. In this case, we check what's included in the name. Currently, it checks based on hard-coded values to determine what link is expected to be present. This uses the object button link addresses we set up earlier to return the address and the user to a website based on the visit here button that is selected. And that pretty much covers the JavaScript used in this project. Let's see how easy it is to update our scene with a new link. First, grab any of the collections that represent a button and duplicate it. Then move the collection as a whole to your desired location and rotate it to the direction you would like it to face. Next, update the values to represent the new number. This should be similar to the other links, where immediately after the word button includes the number, as well as both after the button and after the link for the visit here mesh. The rest of the meshes should not have any numbers at the end.
We also need to open the nonlinear animation view and edit the animation names for this. And lastly, we need to select the armature and go to Object and apply all transforms so that the animation and meshes reflect the proper positions. Then update the texture to represent the purpose of the button. For this example, I will update it to showcase the new 360 Media Player project I completed. Then export the GLB with the camera. Import to 3js.org slash editor. Export again and paste it in the disk source models folder as scene.gltf. Now we have two last things to update in the code. In mainview.js, under the mouse click function, we can update the conditional to check for another link, changing it to include the number we added earlier. Then open button link address and add the new address here for the related link. Now let's run it. In a terminal window, run npm run start dash dev. Two terminal windows should open. This is due to the way Webpack is configured. Then open localhost colon 3000 in a web browser. And let's scroll to the new button we just created. Look at this world. Let's click on it. It highlights just like we expect. And the camera moves too. And now let's click the visit button. Look at that. Together, we've walked through, updated, and ran this 3D portfolio project using JavaScript and Blender. Please let me know down in the comments what you thought of this video. Have a great day and thank you for attending class outside.